really what I wanted to do is, is when I started looking at, at how do I talk about this, and there's so many hours, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of hours have gone into building that cabinet. Um, you know, how do I do that in an hour? How do I talk about it in an hour? And so, so what I really kind of decided to do is to more talk about the parts that make it what it is. Um, and while, while my cabinet is kind of the bleeding edge and there's a lot of beta code on it because I've helped write some of that code, um, if you would have tried to build this cabinet a year ago versus today, uh, a year ago would have been a lot harder. Uh, I think a year ago there was probably about nine or ten of us that had cabinets like this worldwide. Uh, now that number is in the, in the couple hundred. Um, so now we've kind of got a bigger community around it. We've got some tools to allow you to configure it because that's one of the hardest things is configuring everything to make it all work together. Um, especially when we start bringing some of the new hardware capabilities like uh, the, the flashers and the, um, the coils and whatnot. So really I'll talk about the software, the hardware, and kind of the cabinet itself or what goes into the cabinet. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a couple of demos. So really, at the heart of it is, is the emulator um, or the player. Um, and the reason I won't call both of them emulators is there's, there's two pieces of software out there. There's, there's virtual pinball, and that's truly an emulator. And then there's future pinball, which is not. Uh, the main difference between them is one is good and one kind of sucks. But um, aside from that, so if you look at Visual Pinball, so Visual Pinball really started with um, uh, a group of people that built uh, Pin Mame. Uh, Pin Mame, if you've used Mame before, is just that. It takes the, the ROMs for pinball and it, it uh, um, emulates it. And really all it does is it has a little program that can display DMD or, or the scores and it has the rules for the table. Uh, and the nice thing about that is at, at, once you figure out, you can go through the manual, and it's, it's a long process, but you go through the manual and figure out that when you hit the left uh, sling back, that's coil number 45. So you put code in it to say when coil number 45 gets fired, you fire this on the play field and so on and so forth. So that's kind of how you tie everything together. Uh, you don't have to rewrite the rules, although on some tables, like the newer tables, um, people have completely rewritten the rules for those tables and there's a, there's a reason for that and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So Visual Pinball is really an editor and a player. Uh, most of the tables that appear on Visual Pinball are reproduction tables, but there's a growing number of tables that are brand new or reimagination uh, of the, the tables. If you go take a look at my uh, uh, pinball, there's um, a rolling, the old original Rolling Stones, there's the original version, and there's a reimagined version. So all the graphics have changed. The rules are the same, the sounds are pretty much the same. There's some extra music in the background, Rolling Stones music, but for the most part it's the same table. Um, so not only is it the player, but it's the editor too. So I can go and I can change angles on it. If I want my tables to go faster, I can change the angle. If I want to uh, change things, like I want to change colors of lights, or I want to change um, uh, where the, the bumpers are, I could totally do that. Um, it really supports three different uh, modes of playing the games. Um, desktop, which just would run on a single monitor, and I'll show you that. Uh, spanned and full screen. So spanned and full screens are designed for cabinet. Uh, the main difference between them is full screen will only play the DMD, the back the DMD, and the playfield. It won't do anything with the back glass. The black glass comes from other components. And I'll talk about that. Um, Spanned, there's a mode in XP that allows you to span monitors together. And what XP, Windows XP does is it connects them and it makes one large desktop that appears as a single desktop to the computer. So when you run Spanned, you'll have... Let's turn that off. Um, when you run Spanned, what will happen is the play field will be on the right monitor and the back glass will be on the left monitor. And I'll kind of show you all three of them. 
Uh, PinMame is the emulator. Uh, it's the one that actually loads all the ROMs. The tables look 3D, but they're actually two-dimensional. Right? We don't render them. We are working on a project. I'm, I'm on the virtual pinball um, dev team. It's an open source project. Um, so we are actually looking at doing converting it to 3D, and there's been some work done on it where it's not going to be fully 3D, but if you have an upper play field, it'll actually be higher, and then the bumpers will actually have height to them, and the, the, um, the flippers will have height to them, et cetera. So you'll get the ball bouncing a lot more than it does now. Um, it uses copies of the original ROMs, like I mentioned. It has fairly realistic physics. So some of the, the trick shots that you can do on a real pinball, you can do on, on uh, visual pinball. And also, a lot of times, if the ball comes down and bounces off your left flipper and bounces off to your right flipper, and then you catch it, if it works in the real table, a lot of times it works in the virtual table. So the developers have done really good work of mimicking those tables wherever possible. Um, and it can support three monitors, um, right? Playfield, Backglass, and DMD. You don't need all three. Uh, but if you're going to do a cabinet, that's really the way that people have done it. What people have also done is they've taken a large monitor for the play field, a large monitor for the back glass, and rotated the large monitor 90 degrees as well. So it acts as the DMD in the back glass as well. Just kind of part of it is hidden. And that's kind of the form where you can get the software for this. It's a lot of, uh, that's where the new tables get released as well, and there's a lot of discussions about kind of the new features and new capabilities and whatnot. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a quick demo of visual pinball. So, so this is um, Adam's family. You can see this, this is the editor itself. And all these are just objects that I can select. If they're grayed out, then they're locked. But you can go and select all these different objects. You'll see they've got different names associated with them, whether they're visible. And on some of them that have graphics, you can map the graphics onto it. Right? You can see the, the different images that you pull in. So really all you're doing is you're building a model of the play field. And this is not something that I've done a lot of yet, is actually building the pinballs. Uh, there's some pretty talented guys out there that are doing it. Uh, for some reason, most of them are in Europe. But there's a lot of talented guys out there that are building these. Um, and the, I can also look at the back glass. Right now, there's nothing there. Um, and if I go and launch this thing, this one is the desktop version. So see, it'll come up, it'll fire a pin meme, which will load the DMD. And hopefully this won't crash on me. One warning, this laptop doesn't have the power video-wise as the hyperpin, so you'll see it's kind of jerky and it'll jump around and stuff. But I'll give you an idea. So there's the, this is how kind of the, the the table would work, all right? So you'll see up at the top, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a DMD up there. You can see it says creepy right now, kooky, right? Um, so everything now is emulated. The rules of the tables exist, the physics are there, um, and I can go coin it up. Come on. It doesn't want to do it. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of kind of the table one. The, the full screen one, if I run that one, when they build them, they'll usually build them for both. It's just the change of the angle of the table. Where it gets tricky is if there's toys. Because the toys, they will draw the toys and render the toys differently whether they're full screen or whether they're the table, right? Because of the angle that you're viewing it at. Um, so there's the full screen one. The DMD will be up at the top. You can see the bench is rotating there. It's really slow. But, um, so that kind of gives you an idea of, of the emulator itself. And most people, when they're playing on the laptop, will play the previous version. Uh, if you have a newer laptop, it'll do a much, much better job of, of what this one is doing. See if this one decides to take it. Cool. 
you can see that you can hear the sound skipping. That has to do with the speed of the laptop. And then you'll just, you can just totally play it with your... Well, we'll just pause it there. But, um, so that kind of gives you an idea of it. You can play it with the keyboard. Shift keys will, will do the flippers, enters the, the plunger. Uh, if you hit the space bar, the, the slash and the Z key will nudge it and bump it. Uh, and that's how come we do it in the real cabinet, one of the ways that we do it in the real cabinet. Uh, the last type, let me load that one, are the span. And there's some tables that right now, you can see that the way that they've put it, they've got the play field on the right, the back glass on the left. Um, this particular table is one that I haven't been able to get running on uh, the hyperpin. And the reason is that the back glass itself the way that it's supported today. Because um, Visual Pinball doesn't support a back glass, a third monitor back glass, um, it, it's really difficult to, to get it to work. You have to write an external program that will simulate the back glass. So you'll see the back glass on the left, right? right? So I'll give you an idea of it. So normally what would happen is the left one would appear on the t upper monitor on the back glass monitor, and it's fully animated. Um, so one of the things that we are working on is how do we get that really cool back glass? Um, and like, I think a scared stiff has the big spider that rotates. How do we get the spider that rotates animated? That's been done, but it's kind of kludgy. Uh, but some of these, like, like this one, like um, um, there's a couple other ones that, that you know, NBA Fast Break has uh, has that Terminator 3 has the, you can shoot the, the ball up and try to hit a target. For those kind of things, what they've done is they've taken that code and they've put it on the play field. So when you need to do it, instead of looking at the back glass, you kind of look at the bottom left of the play field and you'll see that particular game. But on, on things such as uh, Banzai Run, it's really difficult to do. So that's really visual pinball. And that's, you know, the, the, the heart of, of um, the heart of, of the, the, the pinball machine. Uh, the second one is Future Pinball, and I have it installed on that cabinet, but it's not actually enabled. Um, the tables are extremely sexy. They look great. Um, they're fully three-dimensional rendered. Uh, I'll show you when I actually go to load this thing, how long it takes. So it's, you'll see when I fire this up, it looks almost the same. The reason it, all, it looks almost the same is a guy by the name of Chris Black built Future Pinball. He was on the original uh, virtual pinball team. And then he, Randy Davis built that one and he switched off and there was a lot of bad blood. And so he built his own. He made a decision to not support ROMs. So you cannot tie it into any existing ROMs. People have done some hacks to make it work and there's these big debates as to what, what would Chris say if if he saw you do that, he, that wasn't his intent and stuff, and you're hacking the program. And so it's really like a big soap opera. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth and finger pointing and stuff. Um, so Future Pinball will support a backlash, will support the, the play field, but not a DMD on a third monitor, so it only supports two monitors. So the DMD, the backlash will always have the DMD on it, or what they'll do is they'll put the DMD on the play field. Um, requires a lot more power to get this thing running because it is fully three-dimensional rendered. Um, like I said, three, it could be, it's got to follow the ball, and I don't know if you've ever seen like the um, uh, PlayStation, Xbox have the, the pinball games that when you shoot, the camera just follows, the, t the ball makes you totally sick. Uh, it'll do that. I've never figured out how you can play pinball that way because you can only see part of the play field at any one point. Um, and uh, uh, people that love Future Pinball love Future Pinball. People that love Visual Pinball love Visual Pinball. And it's a holy war. It really is. Like you'll go into one of the forums, like go into Go Pinball and say, just do a post with Visual Pinball and you'll get attacked. And you do the same in VP form and that will happen, right? Um, I actually, I got banned off Go Pinball because uh, I, I called out the guy that runs it. So now I can only access it from work. I can't access it from home because my IP addresses at home have been blocked. But um, not, not that I really care. But. Right, so, and the, the, the biggest problem with it is the physics. 
So they have an, uh, they've, they've licensed a technology called Newtonian physics or something, and it's brutal. Um, you'll, you'll hit, the ball will bounce funny off objects when you try to shoot it off the, the flippers to get skill shots. It's nearly impossible because you can, hit, you can hit the ball exactly the same three times and you'll get it going in three different directions. <coughs> right, so the physics are just not there. Um, so I have it on there. Uh, to, give you an, to give you an example of, of the maturity level of some of the people that, that are working around this, the guy who wrote it, um, he wrote Future Pinball, he made it available, he put a, a time bomb of December 31st, 2010 on it. And about six months before that, eight months before that, he took his ball and went home. He said, you guys are idiots, I'm not supporting anymore, and walked away. And then on December 31st at 11 o'clock p.m., he released a new version that removed um, the, the time bomb and a bunch of features that people have been using. So most of the people that use Future Pinball actually have set the time back on their computers about two years because the older version is better than the new version he just released. Right. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, back and forth with this one. Let me fire this one up. You'll see that the, it'll look very similar. Um, and what I'll do is I won't actually launch, I won't start the table because it'll take about four minutes to render it. I'll do that at the end. But you'll notice it's very similar, right? It's same kind of play field uh, editor. Um, it's, it's definitely more graphical. Uh, when you look at the back glass, for example, it actually has the full back glass. And the reason it has the full back glass is it actually builds it, whereas Visual Pinball relies on other components to put the back glass up, either Hyperpin or uh, UVP or something, and I'll talk about those solutions. So that's really future Pinball. Um, so if all you're going to do is play this on your laptop or on your desktop, you just need those two pieces of software. That's really all you need, one of those two. All right. If you're going to build a cabinet, now it gets to the point, how do I choose my games without having to have a keyboard on, on top of it to go file, open, choose the file name, and whatnot, right? So for that, there's a couple of front ends. The one that I use is Hyperpin, right? Now what Hyperpin is, if you, if, how many people here have done MAME? Have you heard of Hyperspin? Okay, Hyperspin is a, a front end UI. Uh, it's what I use on my main cabinet. Hyperpin is made by the same guy. It's designed specifically for pinball. So when you actually run it, you'll notice down here, here's the wheel. And if you've played the, the, the table in the other room, you saw that wheel, right? Um, so it's designed for a cabinet. It doesn't really work very well on a, um, an upright or a regular uh, monitor like this. I have seen people set that up. I've seen people um, get uh, hyper spin to load hyper pin, but then the, the, the wheel sideways, all the, and they've rotated the logo sideways and whatnot. Um, but, oh, perfect. They can blind people. Um, so really the way that it works is you can see this right here is a wheel. That's called a wheel image. Uh, every single game will have a wheel image. There's a, the back glass. It can play both um, back glass or a video. So most of my tables have a video that have been recorded. So you, when you go to it, you can actually see the gameplay. You can hear the sounds. Uh, then they'll be up top. There's a, the, the back glass. Uh, there's no DMD support. So what I did do is uh, I built a little program that, that has the instructions. It's not running on that one because it was causing some issues. but. It tells you instructions in a DMD format on what to do with, with Hyperpin. But really, you use the flippers to move it right and left. Top flipper will move it one at a time. Bottom flipper will move it alphabetical from A's to B's to C's, etc. cetera. Um, and then the, the start button, I think on mine it's enter button, um, will launch that particular game. Uh, Hyperpin uh, supports both Future Pinball and VP. So in the config file, you can go and choose that. We have gotten it to run other programs. There's some, uh, there's uh, a Slam Pinball. I don't know if you guys have heard of Slam Pinball. It's a pinball you can get for the Xbox and for your, um, for your desktop that um, you literally start beating on the keyboard 
and that will nudge and bump the table. And it's a really rich three-dimensional um, pinball game. People have gotten it to work with Hyperpin as well. There's a back-end little script, script, scripting engine called AHK, which you can go and just script the table. Uh, so you can have it, say, if it's a specific file name, you're going to do run it in a very specific way. Um, it's completely controlled by the pinball, like I said, so you don't need a keyboard to do it once you've mapped all your buttons. Um, and I've, I've gotten to the point now where it's pretty close. Unless something crashes, I don't need to, uh, to bring up the, the particular one. Now, the thing with Hyperpin, if you, if you go and look, take a look at that, the pinball in there, there's, there's a couple of tables that you'll just get a black everything. They'll have a wheel image or it'll have just text and everything else is black. The, what I found is the, um, what takes the most amount of work is not getting the software up and running, is not getting the operating system up and running, it's not even wiring up the buttons. It's getting all the pieces to work together. So if you look at Hyperpin, Hyperpin, when I'm running a visual pinball table, Hyperpin is the component that will display the back glass. So the back glass that I have during the menu will stay there uh, while I'm playing the pinball. So that's where I get the back glass from. Unless I'm talking about active back glass, which is something totally different. But you have to make sure that every component matches. So the back glass, the play field, the play field video, the wheel image, and the table name all need to match, have the exact same name in the configuration file. The configuration file is an XML document. It's a fairly straightforward document. It just has the table, name of the table, the name of the, uh, sorry, the name of the file, the name of the table, the manufacturer, the year, and whether it's a solid state or an EM table, right? But if you can imagine with 173 tables, editing that XML can become very, very difficult. So a year ago, so, uh, this didn't exist, but there is now, there's an editor now that you can just load it up and it gives you a list of all the tables. You can edit the tables that way. So now you can cut and paste very easily and make, make things match, right? Uh, once you get all those going, it kind of figures everything out for you. If you're gonna run it on your desktop, there's one, I used it when I first started out, I haven't used it in a long time. It's called uh, VP Man, uh, it's just a manager. It just, very similar to me if you use BIM32. Very similar UI, it just gives you a list of all the tables. You can choose it with the arrow keys and launch it. So looking at kind of expanding that. So if you've played the table, you'll notice that the back glass on some of the tables are animated. And what I mean by animated is you'll see if it's an older uh, pinball that has um, an LC, uh, like a, a numerical display, you'll see the, the numerical display up here. You'll see lights flash on it, et cetera. Uh, that's done by a component called Ultra VP Server. So this is a, uh, an add-on tool that is, uh, was written by a guy out of, uh, out of Spain that has since kind of disappeared. So unfortunately, nobody has the source code for it. Uh, but it's a little editor. You fire up the editor, you load in the back glass, and you can start dropping lights and displays on it. And what you would do is, uh, when you build a UVP for a system, you take the manual, you look at uh, the LED, or the, sorry, the light placements, there's usually tables in the manual, that tells you on the back glass, light number 14 is for the game over, and light number 16 is for tilt, and so on and so forth. And you create lights in those locations, or text in those locations, and associate them with the appropriate numerical value that corresponds to the light that the ROM is going to fire. If you have displays, you'll usually have six displays, right? You'll have player one, two, three, four. You'll have the um, number of credits and you'll have the, um, uh, the match, right? So you'll create those, you'll create six or seven digits, four of them and two with two digits and so through with the appropriate numbers. And then make sure the name is the same, make sure it's in the right location. And then you change the script uh, within Visual Pinball. Let me see if I've got one here. So if I look at the script, this is the script that actually runs the table. And right here, I've got this, this controller, this set controller. And what, it's kind of hard to read, but it says set controller, create object, VP main controller. You change that to, um, I think it's um, ultra, ultra server, ultra pin server. And that will now pass that data instead of to 
uh, pin name, we'll pass it to UVP. UVP will start displaying it now. So you'll see the lights get animated and whatnot. Um, it does cause a bit of a bottleneck, so a table that is running with UVP, if you don't have a fast computer, you will see some choppiness because of it. Because now it's instead of having just pin name render stuff, UVP uh, render stuff. And the problem with uh, VP today is it's not multi-threaded, it's not multi-core supported. So you can have four cores, eight cores, you could have lots and lots of memory. It doesn't really matter. We're making changes to that, but it's not there yet. Before UVP, there's one thing called um, active backlash. And it, it kind of disappeared and it's making a comeback. And where it's making a comeback is around uh, the EM type, the old real pinballs. One thing that UVP cannot do is it can put really nice, you know, the, the nine or 13 digit um, displays, but it can't do reels. Um, what Active Backlash does is it has those reels and it has LEDs as well. And now it's an executable. So there is a unique one for every table that supports it versus with UVP, it's just a config. It's one component that then runs multiple configs. With Active Backlash, and this is just come back um, last month, so I don't even have any tables running on there with that. But the cool thing about them is the, you'll actually see the reels spin. So they're animated, so you'll see them spin, you'll hear the sounds. So it is kind of cool. Okay, so here's where it gets really tricky, but it gets really cool at the same time. So about six months ago, uh, maybe eight months ago, um, we started working, there was uh, about four of us that started working on, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could make this more realistic? So the first thing that I did to make it more realistic on my pinball uh, is I added, I took two starter uh, so, uh, solenoids from just car starters and I mounted them to the inside of the cabinet and I wired them up to my flippers. So when I hit the flipper, it would trigger this particular solenoid and make a knocking sound. And if you played the game last year, you felt it last year. And I, I got it going literally a couple weeks before the show. So I didn't go through a lot of testing. What I found was that because these are coils and there's magnets and whatnot, well, they, they create magnetic fields, it was generating an EMF that was sending a signal to the keyboard controller, which was sending a signal down the USB line to the computer. The computer was giving you the big screw you and blue screening half the time, right? So it was sitting, we had, right here we had the uh, repair desk and it was sitting right there with somebody ready to power it off every 15, 20 minutes. So it worked well when it worked, but these things were causing problems. So I went and I built a circuit to, to isolate those a couple of months after the show, which worked great. But that kind of started the ball rolling as to like, what else could we do? Wouldn't it be cool if we could do other stuff? So we started talking to this guy in Spain. Um, his name's Mr. Silver. Um, and he started writing a script that would then get the signals about the different coils, because we get that anyways from uh, pin MAME, and we know which coil is being fired, which light is being fired, and wrote a little script that would read a config on a table that would say, when coil 44 fires, that's this particular flasher. When coil 13 fires, it's bu the left top bumper. When 14 fires, it's the bottom bumper. When 15 fires, it's the right bumper. And then he would set a signal to uh, an LED whiz, which is a, a, um, a board, I've got a picture of it. Uh, it's a board that controls LEDs and main cabinets is really what it does. It sends a signal to different, it has 16 different channels, 32 different channels. It sends a signal to one of the channels which fires something, whether it's an LED or a coil. So for LEDs, it worked really well because an LED, you just fire up and you hook up an LED to it with a resistor and has enough current to light those LEDs. Um, what it doesn't have the ability to do is fire coils because the LED whiz does 500 milliamps and these coils require two or three amps. So that just didn't do anything. So we built, started building circuits that would fire relays that would be enough to turn the relay on and the relay would then turn on the coil. Right. That also isolated it from, from the circuit. So originally for this VB script, what would happen is we'd have to manually configure it. We had an Excel spreadsheet that we'd go in and we can put in the values ourselves. 
and then it would create so this config line and the config that's what the config looks like so it's kind of hard to see but like right here it's got there's AFM right so attack from Mars the start button is light 88 the launch button is 86 and then you can see for each of these it actually has every coil and every flipper and every uh, LED that might get fired. So it becomes very, very complex. And if you miss one of these commas somewhere, the whole thing breaks. So this Excel spreadsheet was written that generated this particular line for him. But then what we found is that people started doing, well, I've got three lights on mine. Well, I want five lights on mine. And I want a, I want a, um, a strobe light. And I, want, I don't want coils. I want more LEDs. I want less LEDs. I want more coils. So we started finding that it became really, really difficult to, f to get somebody else's config and manually map everything. Right? I'd written an Excel macro that would do it for me, kind of, and it was kludgy, but it would only do mine and a guy by the name of Chris, because the two of us were the ones who were building a lot of the configs together. So once it got popular, guy that goes by Pixel Magic, what he did is he wrote a little tool that sits on a website that you simply go in now, and what you'll do is uh, you log in, you can look at each table, this is Attack from Mars, so you can see I've selected L1, the start button, that's L88. So I would go in, in here and for every one of these, as I configure the table, I go through the manual, and for every one of these, I would give it the configuration. I can choose colors and whatnot. Um, you can see who did that particular one, that's EXT2K. Um, and then once I do that config, I define the configuration for my table, that's what an LED whiz looks like. So I just simply grab it and I start dragging and dropping components. So for me, L1 is a start button, launch is L2. I've got my uh, flippers are over here 13 and 14, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I choose how I've wired everything up. And then I go and I say load my config. It'll take everybody's configuration and it'll map it to mine and it'll generate that config file for me. So now I cut and paste that into my config file and it works fine, right? So a year ago or three months ago, this would have been impossible to do. Now there's about 100 tables on there already that I don't have to do any configuration for. I just simply w tell them how I've wired it up and it just does it for me. So that, looking at the computer. So I just put one slide, I, I totally forgot about this until this morning. Um, so the computer, you can pretty much go with anything you want. I've seen people go with, uh, you know, Core Duo and higher. Mine's an i7, a three gig i7. So it's got uh, eight, well, I get eight cores, quad cores, whatever it is now. Um, four gigs of memory minimum. I'm using XP 32 bit, so all it can use is three gigs. Um, I started migrating it to Windows 7, but I was having some issues, so I went back to XP. Um, Solid state drives are recommended for the tables, at least for the table part, because the quicker you can load the tables into memory, the better it is. Because uh, for VP, it's really when it renders it, it's just loading everything. Uh, video card, so here's where the, the expense comes in, is the video cards. Um, the table doesn't, doesn't run well when the play field and the back glass are on the same video card. So normally we recommend two video cards. You can put the DMD on the same um, video card as the play field. We found that works best. For mine, I actually have a little USB video card that drives the DMD. Right. Uh, my video cards are two gig NVIDIA GTX 260s. I've seen people go to the 460s, like $400 video cards in this thing. Um, you can get the 260s for about 70 to 80 bucks now, so they're not too bad. When I was buying them, they're around 200. Uh, but a gig of memory is, is usually recommended. Uh, the new version of uh, Visual Pinball, what it does is when they do high resolution tables, there's a setting in there you can go and you can drop them to a lower resolution. So that the video cards, if your video cards can't handle it, they'll give you this great archaic error message that doesn't mean anything. You'll do a search and go, oh, your video card memory is insufficient, and you just drop the resolution on it. So displays. Um, People tend to do 37 to 46 inch on the play field. Mine's a 46 inch. The only reason mine's a 46 inch is because I got a deal on one. Uh, I was gonna put 42 inch in mine. I, I even knew the one I was buying. I had measured it. I knew how big it was. I had a cabinet for it. It was gonna fit perfect. 
And then I went to a recycle place and found a 46 inch Sharp Equios TV for $30 that had the power supply blown on it. So I bought it and fixed the power supply and all of a sudden I, it didn't fit. When I actually put it on top of the cabinet, it stuck out two inches on either side of the cabinet. So I went to a wide body. Mine's a stern wide body. Um, back glass, 24 to 32. Most people use 32. Uh, most back glasses will hold the 30 inch. So you need a wide, wider back glass so you have to, to create your own back box, I should say. Uh, mine's 30, I was able to find one on, on eBay for a good price, so that's why I use it and it fits perfectly. Uh, and the DMD 13 inch, people have used the, the little visors that you can get, the little LED uh, or LCDs you can get on car visors. They've used those, they've used picture frames. Uh, I just use a 17 inch monitor. Dues. So use LCDs or LEDs, do not use plasmas. The reason for that is twofold, especially for the play field. Plasmas do not like laying on their back. They will get damaged and they produce a ridiculous amount of heat. So if you're going to use plasma on your back glass, put a ton of fans back there. My LCD has no fans on the back glass and I have no issues with it. Right. So the controls. So here's where it gets you can do a million different things and go a, different, a million different directions. So at a minimum what you want for buttons is you want your upper flippers, you're going to want your start button, your exit button, so you can exit the game, go back to the menu, your credit button, extra ball for some tables that have extra ball like uh, Indiana Jones, Star Trek, uh, and a launcher or plunger. You'll notice on mine I have a plunger and I have a launcher as well, launcher button. That's because not all the tables support the plunger yet. And some of them are easy to turn on, some of them are not. Uh, so that's why I have both. Yeah? On the plunger, did you find a way to uh, sense how hard you pull the plunger back? So the question was on the plunger, did I find a way to do that, to sense how hard you pull it back? Yeah. The answer is yes, and I'll talk about that solution. Uh, it's not great. We're working on a better one. But um, it, uh, I don't have it configured properly, but on some of the tables, if, the pl there's, if there's plunger support, the plunger will come up. The light, the plunger will flash because I have a, a glowing orb on, on my plunger. If, if it doesn't, then the launch button will flash. But I haven't gotten that fully configured yet. So I'll tell you which one to fire or to use. Uh, optional lower and right pl uh, flippers, those are used in the menu to go alphabetical. And uh, on some of the tables that have MagnaSave and whatnot, you need those particular flippers. So there's a few tables that require them. Uh, pause button, uh, I have one on mine, I, I never use it because you can't really pause pinball on my mind, but it's emulated so you can. Info table rules and table flyers, I have a couple of those and um, um, they're not all wired up properly yet. But. So the, con the controls, so what I'm using in my cabinet is I'm using, um, uh, it's the, how do you pronounce it, is it Lono. Lono. Okay. It's a Lono Arcade controller. It's a new controller from uh, Paradise Arcade. Uh, it's extremely fast. Uh, it emulates it as a joystick rather than with buttons rather than just a keyboard emulator, which some of the other ones do. Um, so uh, you know, I've switched to this from the iPack. Uh, lots of other solutions. So you can go to uh, the iPack from Altamark. Uh, that's probably the best known one right now. Um, you've got uh, the, the GP Wiz. From Groovy Game Gear, I've seen people who do the LED Wiz. Uh, I also, in my cabinet, I have a, a motion adapter from Nanotech. So, a little bit about this particular solution. It is expensive. The customer service is one of the worst customer service you will ever deal with. And it's kind of junky. But it's really, the reason I have it is it's one of the only solutions for one of the things, the plunger. Okay? And I'll talk a little bit about that. So I, I'm on my third or fourth adapter. The last one that failed on me took me three months to get a replacement. I know people that have ordered them and three months later they finally get it after paying for it, right? Um, the guy that, that started the company is a guy by the name of David Foley. And those of you that know me know who David is. David tried to, he became the antichrist for Mame. He tried to copyright the name, the Mame name, and he was going to charge everybody to use it. Um, so he's kind of become the devil. 
So he's built this thing. And um, what it does is it allows you, it has a component that allows you to, to map it to different keys. It really only works for future pinball. It doesn't really work for anything else. So that's why I don't really use it. The plunger, so this is, you can see up at the top right here, I can't point with my pen. That's the motion adapter. And there's a plunger that goes with it. Uh, the plunger, really all it is is, it's a, it's a regular plunger. It's got a cardboard tube in it. It's got a sensor on the end. Um, and it senses how far away the plunger is. So on the tables that support this, as you pull the plunger back, you'll actually see it pull back on the virtual pinball. Right? So it does get supported. Um, I modified mine, I removed the, the shaft out and put the LEDs in mine. Um, we're working on building a better solution for this. Part of the problem, so if you look at this whole kit, this whole kit is $170. It is very, very expensive. They will sell you, they'll happily sell you the plunger for $69.95. And you'll get the plunger delivered to your house and you can't do anything with it because it's useless without the motion board. They don't tell you that. So then you go back and say, I want to buy the motion board. And they go, okay, here's the price for it. And now you've lost the bundle deal of buying the whole thing together. So I only use it for the plunger. But as soon as I have another solution, we're looking at this, how do I get a plunger that I plug right into USB? So I don't need anything else, right? Um, once I have that solution, this thing is going in the trash. Right? I use it because I have to. There is also, there are some, um, I don't have it here, but if you need it, just come ping me, uh, come find me. Um, you can get a little sensor and you mount a little sensor on the size and you can, you can do it yourself as well. Right? It's a little bit kludgy, but it works. Um, they're, they're, and like I said, we're looking at adding support for others. Um, tilt nudge, what I use is I use mercury switches in mine. Uh, that motion board has an accelerometer on it. Um, it, it's a pain to calibrate. So to calibrate the instructions, and I, I kid you not, this is what the instructions say. What you need to do is you fire up the game controller, because it gets the, the motion board gets detected as a game controller. So you fire it up, you uh, pull the plunger all the way out, pull the plunger all the way in, hit next. Then you tilt your cabinet to the right, you tilt your cabinet to the left, you tilt the cabinet back, you tilt the cabinet forward, and you shake the cabinet vigorously. Clicking on next at each one of those. If you've tried to move that cabinet, that thing's about 450 pounds. It ain't going anywhere, right? So it just wasn't usable for me. So I went to Mercury switches. And really all the Mercury switches are doing is they're, they're mapped to the different keys on the keyboard, to, to the Z space and slash. So I got one for each of them, right? And the nice thing about those is, I can go and I can, that's literally the switch that I have. So you can see that little metal part. I just screw that onto a piece of wood on the edge of the, inside the cabinet. And I can bend them and make it more and less sensitive depending on where, what I want to do with it. Okay. Some of the other solutions that are out there, uh, I talked about the motion. I do have a couple of the, the UHID G from Altamark. That's the board you see at the bottom right. Um, I haven't played with it much, honestly. It's a very expensive little board. I paid $60 for it. Um, I haven't really used it. Um, I've seen people that have used it. it. The nice thing about it is it plugs into USB as well. Um, and you have, people have also taken a regular tilt bob, and what they'll do is they'll modify it. Um, the, they'll just use it as the, the switch. The script for VP will eliminate uh, the double bumps. So if you're really shaking the things bumping back and forth, they'll eliminate that bump. I have a little circuit in mind that only allows one per second. So every second, it allows the signal to come through. LEDs and coils, so this is LED Wiz. So that's the one I talked about. Um, you can also use the pack drive or the pack LED 64 from Ultimark. Um, if you're gonna do this, I'd recommend go with the LED Wiz only because Excuse me, only because uh, that's really what the supported one is. All the configs are written for LED with. Almost none of the people are doing the, the pack drive. Now that VB script, I, I talked, I, last week I talked to the developer of the VB script. He actually developed it without ever having one of these hardware devices. So he wrote the whole script, assuming it's all gonna work and then sent it to somebody to work. He never actually fired up the real hardware, which is pretty impressive. Uh, some of the hardware, other hardware buttons. 
I use, uh, for the flippers, I use leaf buttons, but I wanted to be able to change the color on them. So you'll notice as I load the different tables, if the original table had red buttons, my buttons will go red. Uh, Circus Voltaire, my buttons will go purple. Uh, on some of them, you know, they'll go yellow. Uh, I can choose any color I want. So I try to load up the colors for the original table. So to do that, I had to do a, uh, RGB. So I use electric uh, ice from uh, uh, Groovy Game Gear. Uh, you can go see them. They're not perfect, but they work pretty well. Uh, I use the regular chrome LED uh, convex from Paradise uh, Arcade. Uh, they're the ones on the front of my cabinet. I'm not even going to go to the other ones. LEDs. So I have three types of LEDs in my cabinet. On the top, I have Cree LEDs. Um, they're 10 watt LEDs. If I give them full power and you look at them, you will see spots for about six hours. They are extremely bright. They will burn your eyes. Um, they, have, they require heat sink if they're on for a long period of time. So if you go in my cabinet, you'll notice heat sinks. Um, actually, the, the left one is a Cree. The other two are not because I haven't converted them yet. Um, but they allow me to do RGBW, so it allows me to do red, green, uh, blue, and white. And these are the flashes on the top. In the, the two side rails on either side of the, the display, I have uh, three watt. These are $6 LEDs I got from China. Um, they look very similar to that. So this right here, this is the LED itself. And this is just the star heat shield, and that's what you solder onto. So I remove these and mounted them in the wood. So now I've got six LEDs in the rails of the cabinet that sit between the LCD and the glass and they'll reflect off the LCD and glass, kind of giving you a kind of a cool effect. Um, these things were like six bucks. These, the reason I don't have Cree everywhere is these are about $42 a piece. So if you're gonna buy them, be sure that you got the right resistance on it because you don't want to blow these guys, All right? They're not cheap. Uh, and then I've got these RGB drives. They're just little LEDs. That's what changes the colors on the flippers for me. Coils. Uh, originally, uh, I was going to use uh, car solenoids. I found they, didn't, they weren't loud enough. They didn't give me the right uh, signal, or the, the right feedback. Um, I ended up going with real coils. Um, the, the local uh, pinball group. Uh, I was able to find some folks that just had boxes of coils and they went, take what you need, and I found matching sets. So I actually have nine in mine. I have eight under the play field, six, six for the uh, under the play field, two for the flippers, one for the replay knocker. Um, others have used uh, contractors. So these are um, big contractors from Siemens. Uh, they tend to cost $30 a piece, so they were pretty expensive for me, so I didn't go that, down that route. Uh, but those are some of the options, right? Uh, car solenoids work as well. And if you play that table, the table that has the config, the one that'll have all the lights, you'll actually feel as it's bumping through the bumpers, you'll feel the coils firing. <coughs> so you'll get a feel for uh, kind of that force feedback. Uh, other options that I'll, I haven't added yet, uh, shaker motor. So I have it, I just need some of the parts for it. Uh, strobe light, it's gonna go behind the, the back box for things like uh, strobe multi-ball on uh, um, on Attack from Mars, Flash Gordon has as well. Uh, a windshield washer motor. So this thing is freaking huge. It sits in the back. Um, what it's for is for some of the, the plastics that are animated, like Rudy in uh, Funhouse, um, the Ringmaster in Circus Voltaire. So the Ringmaster, as he comes out of the playfield, you'll hear the motor of it coming up and you'll feel the motor. As he goes down, you'll, you'll feel it. When Rudy's eyes move and mouth move, you'll actually hear the motor sounds. It's, it's kind of a cool effect. Um, it's kind of going overboard, but there's so much that you can do. And again, this is all being driven by that LED whiz, right? Fires a relay, the relay turns this particular uh, motor on. So the cabinet itself, uh, you can use an existing cabinet. That's what I'd recommend. Um, for, for the diehard pinball collectors, the cabinet I got was gutted. Um, I personally would not have bought a working one and gutted it. Some people have. Uh, so like I said, mine's a big uh, Stern, big game, wide body. Uh, there's do-it-yourself kits and plans available, so you can actually uh, get um, the cabinets in pieces and put them yourself together, or you can get them fully built. Um, 
The guy that runs the vpform.org site, he actually sells full cabinets. Everything, uh, everything in there except for the ROMs and the configuration of the software. All the hardware is there. Um, and really, what I would recommend is figure out your monitors. Well, there's two ways. Figure out the monitor size and then build, get a cabinet based on, on the decased play field and back glass. Or do the reverse. Find the cabinet that you want and then find a monitor that fits it. And that will limit your, the size of monitor that you can use. And this is kind of how we pulled it all together. So it gives you an idea of where all the coils are, right? Got the lights on the back. Um, replay knocker mine's actually down here. And then all the different coils, the flippers, and then the buttons on the front. So for me, the buttons, the only buttons on the front that are controlled by the LED Wiz are the, the, the flippers, the launch button, the, uh, the plunger, and the start button. The other ones are all hardwired and just ridiculous amount of hours. I've had several people ask me if I'm going to sell these and the answer is absolutely no. Uh, it's just not worth the time. Um, I had more, time, more fun putting it together than playing it. I love seeing people enjoy it, but um, if I, I put my monitor on a hinge so you can pop it up and take a look. Uh, if there's not too many people there, I'm actually gonna go and open it up and show a couple of people. So if you wanna come take a look at what the cabinet looks like, uh, it's crazy inside. It looks like a real pinball. There's so many friggin' wires and coils. Um, that's pretty much it. I don't think I had anything else. Right. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, of, of what it takes to build one of these. It's, it's not a weekend job, uh, but the reason I started is, is my wife, I said to my wife, I want a pinball, and she said, you can have one. <laughs> so I went, which one do I get? And then I found out about this. Actually. I found um, a, a guy in Vegas that had built one, and I started chatting with him. And then I tend to go on Vegas to Vegas uh, on business a lot, so I was down there t chatting with him, and I, we became really, really good friends. So now we kind of work together to build all of these and to get the software written and stuff. If you have a question, could you please Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, do you have a website that has? I don't like a blog that has all your information. I, I don't, but I, I have a lot of it, I have a lot of it posted. Um, if you want to send me an email, my email. Or do you is, have a, a card? Or? I don't, but I can give you my email. It's Barry at Shilmover dot com. Okay. It's, I'm a geek, <laughs> so it's got my last name dot com. Okay, so then, and what's next for me? Is, is this considered done? Like oh, you're done? it's never going to be done. Oh. Um, side art. Yeah. So the one thing I'm looking at is getting art done for the cabinet, so I can uh, get it fully wrapped. Um, and um, really for me is getting, right now if you're using UVP and the LEDs and visual pinball, you'll get stutter. Um, working on getting it so it's stutter free. And then, then it will be done. And the LED whiz, do you control that through UVP? Or do you have to program the chip on the LED So the question is, uh, for the LED whiz, do I, have to pr do I program that through VB or, or, or visual pinball or through a, that's the program itself. It's actually controlled in real time via a script that is launched by um, the VP. So VP launches a script, that script goes and runs it. Yeah. My, question. My question is actually for John. So have you ever seen the recreations of your games on Visual Pinball? And what do you think of them? Um, no, I, I think it's kind of the future, so I'm working on a similar, which I need your help. Um, cool. <laughs> um, no, my, my uh, and actually we were talking about design earlier out in the, the front. Um, I, think the, the, I think the perspective needs to fix. I think the, my, my, my opinion, I think the reason why digital pinball is not successful today is because the, the perspective is not correct. You're absolutely right. So. Um, and, and I think, and I, I teach, um, I teach an art and design college, and so, and we do a lot of illustration, and there's methods in illustration that you can combine kind of hand-drawn stuff with, you know, say a real skateboard wheel, and then when you put the two together, your mind believes it's a real skateboard illustration. And I, I think, I think the same thing happens when you look at a pinball game, and the flippers, you know, they're just like wacky at the bottom, your mind knows, oh, this is not a real pinball game. Yeah. And um, so and I'm on the chat, I'm on BP all the time in the chat, so. Okay, cool. Um, and you know, and I get grief for that comment, but they say, well, if you did it, what would you do? And I said, the first thing I would do, I wouldn't do any more games. 
I would just get some bumpers and get you know the rails and fix that hole. The, 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 I don't know how it's done, but with the camera and the, and the parallax and the perspective. So when I'm standing there, it's you know the, the posts are this way here, but then down here they're at a different. Yeah. And fix all that first, and then start designing. And then I think people, just regular people, when they play, it'll be it'll become real pinball. Yeah, like I totally agree. So that's. So the, the one thing I am working on with is I'm on the, the VP, like I said, on the VP dev team, and we're looking at once we can truly make it 3D so it renders it, we'll be able to say the camera is here. And then you'll start getting that perspective. But you're absolutely right. And, and like Circus Voltaire is one of the tables that I go and I fire up because it's got so much going on when it comes to firing coils and lights and whatnot that if it runs smooth, I know the other tables will run smooth, except for except for Star Trek. That's a totally different story. But uh, that one just doesn't run well for me. But I, I mean, I'd love to chat with you about kind of the stuff that you're thinking of and how, how to do that, because I think um, we're seeing more and more tables start to appear on Visual Pinball, and they don't exist anywhere else, which is kind of the cool things, because I can play virtual tables that nobody else can play because they don't physically exist. Right? It's not a real pinball. So, so are you guys working on a replacement for future pinball with the visual pinball? We're looking at making VP three-dimensional, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you considered using uh, 3D glasses or you'd have a plug in the front? Yeah, have we? Yes, we have. So the problem with 3D glasses is the three-dimensional play field table would be sideways. 3D works this way, but we have the TV this way. So you'd have to stand sideways, which isn't going to work. Um, we have been playing with, I'm, I'm a geek. We have been playing with, um, originally it was the Wii controller to do head tracking. So as you, as you move your head, they'll re-render it, the table, right? Um, I've started fiddling with being a Microsofty with Kinect. So having a Kinect sensor on top, and now as you move, the, the, the table will actually appear three-dimensional. Um, that's a ways out, but it's definitely something we're looking at. What about, what about the analog glasses, the red and blue glasses? We haven't tried that. OK, because I have. And so on, in Windows 32, it doesn't work. Right. And then it's also a DirectX 9. So are you guys doing DirectX 10 yeah, or 11 it, or something? Yeah. So DirectX. it should support at least the red and blue 3D glasses in I the I will future. have to try that. Yeah. have to try that. Any other, what we want is we actually want the ball to come out and hit in the forehead, but we haven't figured that one out yet. How's I'm gonna put? I'm gonna put a little bar and just gonna whack you on the head. Right, so. Do like the Three Stooges episode where Larry's playing the big hammer. Yes. Comes from the pinball and whacks him on the head. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. So see, somebody recreated a pinball, like a Three Stooges pinball. That's what we need. I need to hook that up to LED Wiz to whack somebody on the head, but you can only play the game once. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate your time.